Welcome back, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for session four already of the Crypto Compliance Symposium. It has been an action-packed day. We've done pig butchering, crypto, and money laundering. We just came off of Darknet Markets. A big thanks to uh, Dora Lisa from IRSCI for presenting on that one. And now we are going all the way to the uh, DPRK, an unusual vacation destination. Uh, but hey, sometimes you got to visit out of the way places. I like the way this slide makes it look like ACFCS and DPRK are like co-presenting maybe on this session, um, but we're not. We are exploring the DPRK, also known as North Korea, uh, and its illicit use of cryptocurrency. So thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, you may have joined a previous session or similar session on this topic, so you may see some things you've seen before, but we're also going to give you an update on the latest trends of what is probably the world's most prolific crypto criminal, the uh, the government of North Korea and its associated cybercrime operation. So thrilled to be uh, joined again by Nick and Chris from TRM Labs. They are amazing experts, um, really insightful on this and many other topics. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to them in just a second to uh, get us deep into North Korea's crypto laundering operation and how it may touch you even if you're at a financial institution like a bank or an MSB or other traditional financial sector institution. As always, light up the chat, light up the Q&A. We love to hear from everybody out there all around the world. And in fact, let me know where you're joining us joining uh, us from in the chat. I love to hear your city, state, time zone, uh, ungodly hour that you woke up to watch this session and some in the case of some of you all around the world. So let us know in the chat where you're coming from. Always like to see it. If you have a formal question that you want us to respond to, drop it in the Q&A. If you have a comment, uh, if you just uh, please drop it in the chat. And I see uh, some of our folks from Texas out there. Welcome back. Wow, we have a, a Texas contingent joining us. Awesome. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia, Washington, D.C., Richmond, Virginia. Awesome. So welcome, everyone. South Africa, uh, Orlando, excellent. All right, well, welcome everyone, wherever you're coming from. Uh, as always, keep those questions coming and I will ask Chris and Nick for a standout question at the end. The two people who ask those two standout questions will be entered into a drawing for the Certified Financial Crime Specialist credential, which will be drawn, raffled, whatever the proper word is, at the end of the day uh, during our final closing session. And I have another contest I'm running. It's We're thick and fast with concepts, contests around here uh, to give away two CFCS memberships. Share something you learned from this session on LinkedIn or something from the previous sessions. Use the hashtag CCS Crypto Compliance Symposium 2024 so I can find you. And I'm keeping it on LinkedIn and I'm grabbing some posts uh, and again, we're going to pick two in the closing session for a complimentary year or uh, refreshed year for those who are already members of ACFCS membership. And while you're at it, use that GRIP platform for networking, too. You can show interest, chat. I've been chatting with a few people on GRIP. Um, again, GRIP is the place where you found this session. It's basically your event hub. But you can also express uh, interest in networking with folks. You can even set up meetings, um, do video chats, and there's some speed networking at I think some of you might have just come off a of networking session. There'll be another one later in the day. So be sure you're using the chance to connect and network with your fellow members. Speaking of membership, if you haven't taken uh, one of our member emerging risk courses, I got one to recommend for you. There was a pig butchering one that we just launched, I think last month or the month before. Um, and the inimitable Aaron West, who you heard from in the first session, actually helped put together some of the content on this one. So uh, this is one of the many online courses that you will find in your member benefits if you have not checked it out already. Hopefully you won't need the troubleshooting tips, but just in case, if you run into any issues, refresh your browser, um, close out of your, your other tabs and applications, it's gonna be a little resource hungry, or close out and rejoin the presentation. And as always, you'll find your certificate of participation there on the console, along with all the other many boxes, interact with us. And please fill the survey at the end of the session and let us know your thoughts and feedback. Okay, made it through that one and not too much time. Um, thanks for bearing with me while I get to the true stars of this session. Uh, the the uh, the 
guy on the uh, left here, who I believe is doing the Cupid shuffle with two small children in a basement, is uh, Christian Shevsky. He's the head of global investigations at TRM, uh, previously a special agent with IRSCI, uh, and uh, was doing fantastic work with that agency on crypto crime investigations and has continued to do so at TRM Labs. Um, and he, as mentioned, is uh, really one of the, the leading experts in the world on a wide variety of crypto crime issues and crypto investigations on both the public and private sector. Always a pleasure to have him here. Uh, joining him is his colleague, Nick Carlson, senior investigator, appropriately woodsy in this image on the right here, uh, previously intelligence, intelligence analyst with the FBI, Korean linguist as well. Uh, and... Uh, I believe last time we did this, Nick, you mentioned you used to provide like White House briefings related to like North Korean issues, too, if I'm getting that right. So uh, uh, illustrious, <laughs> illustrious past here in this field. So uh, thanks again to you both. It's always a pleasure having you. And I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started. Thanks so much for having us here, Brian. Really excited to be back. Uh, always a pleasure to be joined by you and Nick. Um, yeah, I tried to use a little AI to spice up some profile photos. We have Nick looking all masculine in the woods, you with your beard, and then me last week of school for the kids last week. So it's me just escaping them while trying to work from home um, as they terrorize me. But I'm sure many yeah, people can relate. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll power through. Um, yeah, let's go over the agenda a little bit. So uh, first, I want to start with a TRM overview. Who is TRM Labs and why are they even here talking to us today? And how does that have anything to do uh, with the topic at hand? And then we'll get into the specifics about North Korea and how, as you mentioned, they are the world's first and foremost uh, prolific thieves and money launderers when it comes to cryptocurrencies. And we'll kind of talk about who they target, how they launder, how they cash out, because you know crypto only goes so far in today's ecosystem. Uh, particularly if you're a heavily sanctioned country like North Korea. Talk a little bit about disruption, um, although Nick and I probably won't go too deep in that, just in case, I don't know how great you are at screening your attendees today. I don't want to spill all the <laughs> secrets. And then uh, some case IP studies. IP address to... ping to uh, Pyongyang, so <laughs> probably no issues there. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, I'm sure that was purely for security reasons only. And then uh, we'll touch on a couple case studies to make it kind of come to life. And as you mentioned, definitely do please leave some questions for us throughout this if there's anything we can kind of expand on or clarify for you all. So first, TRM. Uh, TRM Labs, we're a blockchain intelligence company, so we produce software. Uh, a majority of our clients are public institutions like FBI, Internal Revenue Service Criminal Investigation, uh, and other law enforcement entities around the world, uh, also regulators. Um, and financial units around the world use our software to analyze crypto transactions. We also have clients in the private sector as well. So many of the large exchanges you've heard of use us as part of their anti-money laundering policy. And I'll touch on that in a moment. But first, like what is blockchain intelligence? So, you know, many people are probably familiar with Bitcoin. That is one of the first and most uh, widely known cryptocurrencies in the world. And every transaction that ever took place in Bitcoin is public. Everybody can see that address A sent one Bitcoin to address B. Uh, but we take that a step forward and we add additional intelligence to the various blockchains and assets that are on that, on those blockchains. So how do we do that? Um, well, we have uh, proprietary data intelligence and teams that use various heuristics to add intelligence to crypto transactions. We have teams with dedicated threat hunters, people that focus on specific threats such as terrorist financing, uh, child sexual abuse material, darknet markets, uh, sanctions evasion, and so forth. And so we take that data and add it to the blockchain data. So instead of address A, send to address B, we know that it is a terrorist fundraiser that is sending one Bitcoin to a terrorist network. We also do a lot of scraping and various um, open in source collection to get information that's widely available and out in the public. And then we also have various partnerships with um, different data companies around the world as well that help provide proprietary data. So that way, at the end of the day, the public sector and private sector can make better informed decisions about how to use blockchain information. And just kind of give a better idea of what exactly 
um, those offerings kind of look like. The three main categories are wallet screening, and transaction monitoring. Those are specific for like crypto institutions, like a Coinbase or a Binance of the world. So they can see, oh, this is a sanctioned Bitcoin address and it's coming into our platform. We should immediately freeze it or at the very least have a conversation um, with uh, the account holder. Those do uh, enhance reports on Know Your VAS. So VAS is a virtual asset service provider. And that is any type of business that conducts um, some type of business using virtual currency. And that could be an exchange like Coinbase. It could be a place that you buy prepaid gift cards. It could be a place that you convert Bitcoin into Ether, two different types of cryptocurrency. And then the one that Nick and I use the most and investigators use the most is forensics. So that's actually taking the Bitcoin information using our enhanced information behind it and building it out visually. So you can have one transaction and spiderweb that into thousands or hundreds of transactions, addresses to be able to get some type of conclusion about what actually took place. And we'll show some examples, but basically like if money is stolen, how do we get from point A to point B? Um, I want to touch on chain abuse. Uh, that is a website and a platform that TRM partnered with other leaders in the crypto space to provide. It's chainabuse.com. It's free for anybody. And I get maybe you don't investigate North Korea or you know maybe even touch on crypto at all. But I think this is a thing that could be potentially relevant to anybody on the call. Uh, it's a place that victims and researchers can go to report various types of scams and frauds that are going on in the crypto ecosystem. And so theoretically, somebody, I think you talked about PigBlitchin already this week. So your attendees are probably well-versed on that, but maybe you get those random text messages of somebody and then they eventually ask you to invest in this crypto project that's about to go to the moon. Um, you could check on chain abuse to see if anybody's already filed a report saying that like, yes, they took all my money, do not invest. Uh, but also more importantly, that information can be shared with law enforcement if somebody was to opt into it. So uh, law enforcement, around the world use this application to either initiate or build out investigations and it can be really powerful. And then also the exchanges that partner in can see this information in real time. If somebody's trying to cash out money that has been reported on, potentially there's an opportunity to be able to get money back to the victim. And then lastly, on chain abuse, there are also some reading material on there. So you can actually go and we provide advice about how to spot scams. Also things you can do to be able to try and stay safe and be proactive. And unfortunately, if you are a victim, there's advice on there on being able to hopefully help you try to recover those funds and who to contact. So uh, those things are all relevant. Hopefully it's never you that has to go there, but statistically it might be somebody you know that eventually needs this advice. All right, next, one of my favorite parts uh, about work with you, Brian, we've got a full question to kind of start it off with North Korea. Do you want to read it or do you want us to? Yeah. Yeah, I'll throw it out there. How much crypto has North Korea stolen over the last six years? Is it 1 billion Dogecoin, 2.8 billion in uh, in fiat, uh, 1.9 billion in uh, euros, maybe? I'm, I'm losing track of my, uh, my, my currency signs there. Or is it 319 million? So this is the last six years, so six-year period. Um, and we already have some questions rolling in, so I'll throw one at you while we wait for some poll answers uh, uh, to come up. What AI generator did you use for your profile pictures? Did I say I did? Uh, nobody assumes that I just freehanded it. Uh, it could be. I think I did. It could be. Yeah, no, I used Midjourney. My Nick asked me what my prompt was for my own. Nick's was pretty easy. It was using his profile picture, looking stoic in the woods with a computer. Mine was using my profile picture and then running away from two blonde children in my basement with a Bitcoin logo on the wall. Uh, another question a joke, here. But I already had a visitor during this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> another question here. How do you go about dark web monitoring? Uh, where do you start? Where do you find the onion sites and forums where you're gathering some of this information? Well, first I would say that's why like this team is so important to TRM and like how uh, skilled the people on these teams actually are. So they, like Nick and I are on the global investigations team. We like to think that there's an on-chain event. We are best at investigating it to see uh, what happened, where did the money come from, where did it go, and who's potentially behind it. These threat intelligence teams focus on specific threats. Uh, so like we might be in all different types of ones at any given moment. 
so they kind of have one just know like where these threats kind of live and kind of when something comes up they're very timely to be on it and if it goes down they are in the community so to speak to understand where it might be going next but there are various sites to kind of like keep track and scroll through uh to keep like surfing through darknet onions to try and find new sites uh, of course, if somebody's going to put something on the dark net, generally it's because they want another person to find it. So there are like in each threat kind of different ways that people advertise where to go. Um, and then also just having like various different sources. Uh, sometimes there are companies that will provide this information as well. Uh, but each one is kind of on its own and a little bit of legwork. Yeah, yeah and there's, there's a, a bunch of, of like aggregator sites, right? Because, yeah, you know, if you're trying to run a uh like you say like a dark net market right you want people to know you exist uh and so there are a lot of folks who go out there and kind of pool these together and make it easy to find but then like telegram right telegram is where almost i mean every bad guy in the world basically congregates on telegram now uh and so you'll often find in these uh you know telegram chats basically uh references and urls to the to the onion sites yeah, a lot of scam bibles floating out there on Telegram, among other sites, where you can find kind of an aggregated list of uh, places to start. It's hardly everything that's out there, but definitely, uh, definitely uh, a place to start. All right. Well, we have the questions pouring in on uh, uh, a lot of questions on dark. Clearly, some people joined the darknet market session and are still in darknet market mode. So we'll we'll, we'll get to those <laughs> questions in just a second. But let's uh, let's jump into these poll results here. And the overwhelming favorite is 70%. Maybe you, maybe uh, some of these folks have uh, are either prolific Googlers or joined us for a previous one of these. So how'd they do? Spot on, yes, yeah, 70% on the mark, $2.8 billion. Um, so not so a actually significant a, amount of money. It's actually none of the above. I typoed that. <laughs> it should be 2.6 billion, but people are in the right ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> I just assumed it was inflation over between today and yesterday when we talked about this. <laughs> Six and eight, come on, give me give me a break. They look similar. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, the actual number, uh, according to TRM, is about 2.6. Um, and there are other estimates out there you might see, uh, but that kind of comes down to what we attribute to a hack. Uh, in TRM, we're pretty conservative. We try to keep it in the range of things that we're really sure about. Um, and so this is kind of a conservative number. and even that right it's kind of shocking uh over two and a half billion dollars that's a lot of money to steal in any context um but especially in the context of north korea uh, that's a huge 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 amount of money um and i think the last time we gave this session it was maybe like october of last year uh and this number for 2023 2023 had been a really quiet year on north korea hacking uh, I think at that point they were down around 250 or 300 million dollars, and they just ran the board the last six months of 23, and ended up stealing nearly. They nearly equaled their haul from 2022, which had been a banner year for them. Uh, so, a lot of money stolen, uh, and honestly, like 2024, we're we're pretty quiet at this point. Uh, so we may see another repeat this year, uh, kind of another run up at, at the second half. Yeah, it's almost like Nick was taunting him. And just to like kind of call this out, like uh, we'll go into some more detail as well. But like, why is North Korea even stealing all this crypto? And it's because of they are almost entirely cut off from the world's economy. There are still some countries that deal with them, but like the US has completely sanctioned them. So they cannot interact with us. And so they strategically made a good decision to invest in stealing this funny electronic money where essentially anybody that has crypto anywhere in the world could potentially be a target. So they focus on exchanges, businesses, and we'll talk about it, and also specific uh, rich individuals. And, you know, it could be highly uh, rewarding payoffs if they're successful, as we've seen. Yeah, I mean, one thing we'll talk in, in more detail later in the presentation here, but but crypto basically was this extremely fortuitous uh, thing, phenomenon for North Korea. Uh, because around 2015, 2016, uh, it, it's interesting, like you talk to people and they're, they're like general sense of North Korea. For a long time, North Korea has been described as like the most sanctioned country on earth. Um, but that, that really wasn't true up through about 2016. Um, and so North Korea, up until that time period, they were very active, uh, you know, trading in normal commodities. They had somewhat normal uh, relationships with lots and lots of countries, especially in Asia. Uh, 
And as that kind of got curtailed, the rise of crypto counterbalanced it, right? And so, you know, even in a good year, North Korea's trade volume was, you know, in the low three, two to three billion dollars, and that was gross trade, you know, export. Uh, so basically, the idea that they've been able to to, to supplement that, right, or replace that with hundreds of millions of dollars a year in what's essentially pure profit, uh, where, you know, those those gross trade volumes, those involved lots of expense. Uh, so the net profit was quite small. Uh, crypto is this, you know, very fortuitous event for North Korea that basically allows them to continue to survive because uh, without it, uh, they'd be in really serious uh, economic trouble. So kind of just the rundown here, the summary of, of what North Korea does, why, how they steal, um, and how they actually consume that money. Uh, number one is they are hackers, right? And in the world of kind of crypto thefts, there's a bunch of different kind of categories you may hear about. Um, I think a really common one you may have run across is a, a smart contract exploit. Um, and, and that's not what North Korea does, right? They're not out there finding vulnerabilities in contracts uh, and using those to manipulate underlying liquidity pools and extract money. Uh, what they do is they hack your computer and they steal your passwords, basically. Uh, that's what private keys are. Those are basically passwords for crypto wallets. Um, and so, yeah, they'll get you to open, uh, you know, an attachment. They'll get you to click a link. And they do that, and then they monitor your behavior. They see your, you know, uh, keystrokes, or they find a non-protected password file on your computer, uh, and then they take your money. So, you know, typically when you're looking at recent hacks, if it falls in that category of, uh, you know, a password or a private key-based theft, you already have a pretty good chance of this being a North Korean hack. Um, you know, who they target, it's kind of, I think the best thing to analogize it to is like uh, migratory hunters, you know, back in the distant past. Uh, they go where the, where the game is, right? They go where the money is. And so when you go back, you know, earlier in time, that's mostly these younger exchanges. You know, you go back to like 2017 and 18, uh, and the crypto economy, the business, it's much less uh, mature. And so you had lots of these young exchanges that were really, you know, uh, not sophisticated companies, right? They didn't have cybersecurity policies in place. They often had distributed workforces without any real cybersecurity. Uh, and so they were, you know, ripe for targeting. Uh, now, uh, typically a large exchange, you know, something like a Binance or Coinbase, they're really hardened targets. Uh, they basically, it's impossible to steal hundreds of millions of dollars from those kinds of companies now. Don't tempt them again, now. Nick. I know, I know, I don't want to do this. <laughs> we'll see what happens next. Uh, hopefully not. Uh, but then in 22, you know, the, the kind of the economy, it shifted, right? And lots of money was flowing into these uh, services called bridges. And this is a way, you know, for you to move funds from one blockchain to another. Uh, heavily targeted those uh, entities like the Ronin Bridge. Uh, they targeted Harmony. Uh, and they were probably among some of the Nomad Bridge exploiters. Uh, but then 2023, uh, you know, up until May of last year, they, they basically did nothing. Uh, and then they went on a spree and they hacked anybody and everybody. It was a really, really diverse cast of victims. Uh, you know, what the overarching theory was, I have no idea. Uh, I suspect they were just going after any low hanging fruit. Um, but I, as you can see, I, I come from a rural area uh, and it's really common where I grew up here to go into farms and orchards after the harvest. Uh, we always call it gleaning. You know, there's always fruit left on the trees after the harvest. Uh, I think that's what they were doing in 23, basically. They were going after all the, the stuff that was left behind, the smaller exchanges, uh, smaller services. And yeah, they nearly equaled their, their biggest haul ever. Um, so, you know, what do they do, right, after they've stolen the money? Uh, now they have hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, how do they actually convert that into something that's usable? Um, the first thing they have to do is they have to launder it, right? They have to move it through these intermediate phases to make it hard to track. Uh, and that's really, you know, what we specialize in here at TRM uh, is following that process and breaking through the different techniques they're using to obfuscate the middle here. Um, but the, the whole point of what they're doing is very different from 
uh, like a say if you were a hacker you know living in germany or the united states you know your whole emphasis is going to be on making sure that nobody ever figures out that you did this crime and north korea is a completely different game uh, they really don't care if people ultimately figure out it was them in fact i they're so careless in a lot of respects about these crimes i i, I almost think they want people to know uh so what they do is they're just buying time and space, right? Uh, because there are all these interdiction points along the way where you know the FBI uh, and private industry folks like us can try to intervene. Nick may have cut out in the rural list that he's surrounded by, but like to kind of emphasize his point, if you've ever seen the movie, The Town, you know, when they had that uh, you know, no. nerve wracking getaway in the car and they try and ditch it. Uh, that's what North Korea is when they're ditching the one car. They're totally, yeah. To they're the just next basically car, the ditching next car. cars, stealing new cars, ditching those cars, stealing new cars all along the way just to try to create. Um, but again, the, the ultimate point is they don't care. You know, at the end, you know, it's them. That's fine. Uh, that's not their problem. They're sitting secure yeah. in Pyongyang. I mean, that's kind of a. <laughs> we, may have, uh, we may have lost you again, Nick. <laughs> you know, He's what is North Korea stealing this money for, right? They're stealing it because they need to buy stuff. They need to buy petroleum. They need to buy, uh, you know, uh, weapons, uh, material. They need to buy all kinds of gizmos, you know, for their ballistic missiles. And people don't sell that stuff in crypto, uh, at least not yet. Uh, so they have to find a way to turn all this anonymized or semi-anonymized crypto into real money. And the way they do that is, I mean, almost always through Chinese brokers. Um, and I think somebody mentioned earlier in the chat here, uh, China is North Korea's gateway to the world. I mean, almost all of North Korea's, you know, licit trade is funneled through China. And so all their infrastructure uh, is in, uh, uh, you know, China itself. So the folks who actually buy their stolen crypto and, and turn it into fiat currency and Chinese banks are these Chinese brokers. Uh, so, you know, what does the government industry do to try to deter this? It's typically trying to, uh, you know, interdict funds when they can uh, and get them back to the victim. But it's, you know, I would say clearly not totally successful. Uh, North Korea is not stopping and they don't really have uh, strong incentives to stop. So the other thing here too, right, is uh, I think hacking tends to get all the attention and interest, um, but North Korea depends on crypto for a lot more all right, than just the stuff that they can make by stealing it from other people. Uh, they use a lot of this crypto for their intelligence operations. Um, so, you know, the actual entities that are doing these hacks, uh, it's typically the Reconnaissance General Bureau, which is kind of like, uh, like this amalgamated intelligence agency in North Korea. Uh, they also use some of this crypto to pay their sources, right? Um, if you recruit somebody to commit espionage uh, in South Korea, you need to pay them. Uh, typically, people don't spy for free. And we have seen a couple cases where they have used stolen Bitcoin to pay uh, their actual sources. Uh, other stuff, they use it um, for their actual cyber espionage. So if you're going to go out and, you know, hack... Uh, an intelligence target, right? Um, like South Korea Supreme Court, they were hacked by North Korea a couple of years ago. How do the North Koreans do that? They have to have all the cyber infrastructure in place to actually receive you know, the exfiltrated data. They often use crypto to, to pay for that infrastructure, to pay for the VPNs, to pay for the websites uh, that they funnel all this information through. And then finally, uh, it's also a really key lubricant for IT work. Uh, so North Korea, they may also make, you know, in addition to thefts, they make a lot of money from providing what I think people would, you know, call licit uh, web development services to ordinary companies all around the world. Uh, so, you know, if you go onto a, um, uh, like a web development freelance website where you can find a developer to work for you, uh, North Koreans love to masquerade on those sites uh, and get jobs working for Western companies uh, that they can also 
you know, potentially use as entry points for thefts, but they're actually just providing normal uh, IT services. You know, the problem with that is it's illegal uh, in the United States, especially, but uh, sanctions at all, you know, UN has enforced sanctions that uh, make that not licit. Chris, you want to talk yeah, about this one? So, sure. Yeah. And then kind of hammer points home about what Nick just talked about. Um, I know a lot of people here are from the banking community and maybe they don't onboard or offboard crypto clients. Uh, but it is just like also a good reminder of that, like you can build the world's best infrastructure. You can have the best defenses. But at the end of the day, it's going to be humans that are always going to be the soft targets. Like you have this beautiful wall, but if you've got the door, you forgot the lock at night because you were in a hurry. Doesn't really matter. And so, like, there's always going to be that emphasis to be able to target. And these are kind of reminders of, you know, stay on top of your, your operational security. And uh, unless you're my mortgage company, feel free to have all of that liquidated and removed. But otherwise, <laughs> like, please stay on top of it. And so um, I think what's interesting, too, about North Korea, particularly from the crypto realm, is that it has driven policy and kind of uh, priorities in other arenas. So, for example, Tornado Cash. Uh, back uh, a little while ago was uh, sanctioned by the Treasury Department here in the United States. And Tornado Cash was a place where you could put in Ether, uh, another cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, and it would mix it around, like say 100 people put in Ether into one pot, and then the pot pays out the Ether on your behalf. And so it's hard to draw that, draw that direct line between the two payments. You can see the ins and outs, but you don't necessarily know who payment is what. So the government took a position that this computer code for the first time uh, could be sanctioned. And that was in large part a decision that was pushed on by uh, a, a large portion of the funding that went into Tornado Cash was directly attributed to hacks by North Korea. And then when something like that is seen and it's put on the White House's uh, kind of docket of this is an issue that we need to pay attention to, the rest of the uh, administration is going to pay attention and try and do something proactive. And you can see it kind of like continues to include CEO of a cryptocurrency mixing service being uh, charged with money laundering. And um, there have been other cases, particularly out of Washington, D.C., where Nick and I used to work, where they were a little more obvious that those cases should be brought. There were those mixes were advertising on darknet markets, particularly aimed towards darknet vendors selling narcotics and other illegal activities. And this is more so of not necessarily targeted those, but everybody and the government's still kind of taking a proactive, aggressive uh, approach about it. Uh, so who they target, Nick kind of mentioned the timeline, how initially it was predominantly crypto hey, sorry, exchanges, Nick and I. Cut out for a second. I'm still here. Uh, Back in like 2018, Nick and I worked some of the first exchanges that were hacked. Uh, you can see some pretty significant amounts of money, and that was in figures for those days, like KuCoin, 280 million in 2020. Um, if they had just held on to the funds, it surely would be worth substantially more. But as Nick mentioned, they kind of um, very quickly and proactively try to liquidate those funds to get it into traditional fiat, whether dollars, yen, euro, whatever it might be. And then, as Nick mentioned, being opportunal, opportunistic, and when bridges started becoming more and more prominent, um, North Korea started targeting those in 2022. So the biggest one, of course, is the Ronin Bridge, $612 million, which is just an amazing amount of money to be able to get your hands on. You can see why it's quite lucrative for them to stay on top of those. Uh, I think part of it is just like, this race for people to be able to put out these products and services and be the first. And some of them people maybe didn't expect would balloon into something that would hold hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but that became opportunity for North Korea to pounce. And then uh, no clear pattern uh, in the end is, and I think that's just opportunistic. If there's an opportunity, they'll go and try and get the funds. So whether that's you know a crypto casino or DeFi protocol exchanges, Whoever has money is on the billet to be able to be a victim to North Korea. Yeah, no, I mean, 23, it was like a really crazy spread of all kinds of different targets. Uh, some of them, you know, fairly obscure uh, and some of them like really fascinating, like the atomic wallet hack. I still don't understand how they did what they did in that case. Uh, they basically, there was some flaw in the wallet itself and they were able to exploit it 
Um, so it was very atypical for a North Korean hack. Yeah, um, and I think there was a comment about like, is this the low end? Nick had specifically said it's the low end for estimates. And uh, second movie reference the presentation, Home Alone, you know, they got the wet <laughs> bandits, they want to leave a calling card. If only North Korea would be so generous to do that. Um, <laughs> you know, the, we, we kind of see them have their fingerprint, they're going to do specific things uh, in a certain way that is unique to them. There will also be in situations where in the actual software that they use to conduct these hacks, there might be certain tells such as Korean language or um, mm -hmm. that same exact software was used in another hack that we have better attribution was North Korea. Um, and sometimes it's just kind of anybody's best guess that like, yeah, we think it's them. There's a point where it overlaps with the previous hack and the laundry process. So it might be them, but it could also potentially be the cash out point. So this broker that bought the Bitcoin off of them just happens to be the same person that's willing to do it for whomever. Uh, so it's not always an exact science. Yeah. And there's, a, I think, a relevant question here, too, that goes even farther back in time uh, from Victor about how did North Korea even develop this ex expertise? You know, how did they get into this business? Uh, and, and really, like my story on this, uh, and I think Chris came just a little bit later on this, was the Sony hack. Um, so North Korea, it kind of used to be a bit of a joke. Uh, they used to do a lot of web defacement attacks in South Korea. But in 2014, they hacked Sony Pictures Entertainment because of a movie that came out. Uh, the interview it was an awful movie. Uh, if anybody's seen it, but you hush uh, your mouth, Nick. <laughs> maybe, maybe, okay, maybe treasure. it should have gotten an Oscar. I don't know. Yeah, uh, but uh, that was really, uh, really key. If you go back, there's an amazing indictment the FBI Los Angeles put out on this. Um, that it, I highly recommend it. I mean, it's a book. It's like literally organized by chapter, and it goes into the people. Right, the actual North Korean hackers who did that. And they're the same people who did the Bangladesh heist in 2016. And the people who did the Bangladesh heist pivoted into crypto in 17, 18, 19. Um, so it's a really clear like development arc uh, for how they uh, you know, got into hacking altogether. Um, and and it's, it's really great. I highly recommend reading that uh, LA indictment on the Sony case. That's our third Brian, movie reference. Yeah, our third movie reference of the uh, the session so far. So we're doing good. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give you guys a chance to answer this poll. We're gonna move through this one pretty quick because, as always, the clock is our enemy. But if you are looking for love on the internet, should you confirm the authentic authenticity of the person, do a video interview, then meet in person, verify their background, ask where they stand on imperialist Americans, or all of the above. So. Obviously, there's a little element of comedy here, but uh, also a, a legit point behind this. So uh, I'll, I'll throw out one question while we, uh, while we wait for some responses to come in here. And this one actually came in on the chat, and it was, I thought one of the uh, previous presenters said that virtual currency is illegal in China. So how are there Chinese OTCs that are key to facilitating this North Korean laundering? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, and it, it's really, uh, I think it kind of goes to the question of what is law in China? <laughs> and you have the de jure and the de facto, right? De facto, China is one of the like, most active cryptocurrency environments in the world. Um, crypto is extremely popular there, especially USDT on Tron um, is highly dominated by Chinese users. And it's incredibly high liquidity, I think. Some estimates, uh, the total volume on Tron USDT last year was several trillion dollars. Uh, and, and we're going to get into it in more detail a little bit later. But basically, uh, that, that whole ecosystem is really popular for Chinese to get money out of China. Um, and the whole like sub shadow banking industry that exists to, to aid Chinese in getting money out of China, that's where crypto becomes really important. And it's also really important to the criminal activities of lots of people uh, from Mexican drug cartels to North Korean hackers. Uh, it's, it's like a really underreported, under misunderstood issue. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, thank you for that answer, Nick. Last chance on this one here. Uh, and I'm going to move ahead. All the above. A lot of people would ask their love interest for their stance on imperialist Americans, uh, <laughs> according, to this, according to this poll. Uh, but yeah, I mean, let's uh, let's talk about why this matters. Uh, what uh, what was the point of this uh, this polling question, Chris? 
yeah, Nick and I often get hit up for dating advice, so it makes sense that we would integrate that into our um, <laughs> presentation. But you can imagine that if you're going to have a you know a remote romantic relationship, there's a certain level of vetting that you would do. Uh, similar in the employment space, um, you should be doing a certain level of vetting. Um, this leads us into talking about the role of North Korean IT specialists, especially during the rise of COVID. Many jobs were outsourced overseas and to remote people, and people were desperate to get help. Uh, and North Korea, being the astute um, hackers that they are, noticed an opportunity to, one, get their foot in the door for specific companies to get access that they otherwise may not be able to get, uh, but also get credibility and to get paid for it. So, you know, a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, so uh, exactly to Chris's point, um, there's, there's two issues here, right? There's the hacking, uh, and then there's just IT services. Uh, and sometimes those merge together. So, you know, how do North Koreans hack? Uh, a really common one is just a job offer. Um, so if you happen to get like a really lucrative job offer from somebody you've never heard of before, you should be cautious, especially if they say, download this uh, PDF file to get, take a look at the job description. That's a bad idea. Don't do it. Uh, they also, you know, will masquerade just as people that, you know, they'll create email addresses that look like a friend of yours, um, and send you files, expect you to open them. But then there's this convergence, right, of the IT work and the hacking. Um, and we've seen this a couple of times where, uh, especially DeFi projects in the crypto space, it's really hard to find programmers who are familiar with the languages being used, uh, in that space. And so. Often they'll hire them, you know, sight unseen, no verification, uh, and and there's this like, you know, interesting uh, anonymity that a lot of uh, DeFi folks insist on, um, and so uh, North Korea can take advantage of that, right? And they can get into your project by using that ecosystem basically, and then they'll steal your money. Uh, you know, if you have a project uh, and you, they get access to the private keys to it, they'll just walk away with your money. We've seen that happen a couple of times. Um, but then, you know, the story from The New Yorker, if anybody has the time, wants to read it, it's a really incredible and completely, you know, jargon-free just narrative about how North Korea has done some really extraordinary stuff, like hiring actors, Spanish-speaking actors, to pose as executives for companies in a job search, just to get you to believe that you actually are talking to a real uh, company. Uh, so they'll, they've gone to some pretty extreme lengths uh, to, 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 to penetrate um, target companies. Yeah, let's Nick. Let's move uh, to the laundering process of how they actually cash out for the same yeah, time. Let's sure. start with this one. I guess we are getting pretty tight. Uh, yeah. So I think first it's hard. You know, it's hard to understand North Korea right without understanding how North Korea was. And so this is a great report. If anybody wants to read it from C4ADS, uh, they did this back in 2016. There's a case that I worked on when I was in the government. Um, but but this is basically how North Korea used to work. Um, they would sell commodities uh, almost always in the Chinese market. They had partners in China who would take those sales and turn them into you know just uh, deposits in banks, and then take the North Korean share of it, move it to offshore shell companies, and then those offshore shell companies, at the direction of North Korean bankers uh, who managed this whole situation would go and buy the commodities that North Korea wanted. And so it's often like really mundane stuff. Uh, and you'll see this too with, you know, contemporary um, crypto theft is they're buying, you know, really normal things like food oil, uh, you know, uh, canola oil, they're buying soap, they're buying petroleum. Uh, it's not necessarily uh, really nefarious stuff, uh, but this is, you know, the lifeblood basically of the North Korean economy. Um, and the way that, you know, this touches onto important and like highly uh, sensitive stuff like the nuclear weapons program or arms sales is understanding how North Korea functions. So North Korea, it's not a normal government, right? I mean, I think everybody understands that just off the top, but a really key point is that they don't have a normal budget process. Um, and it's not even akin to what a communist government, say like the Stalinist, you know, Soviet Union was like. The way North Korea works, uh, my best analogy mm -hmm. is it's uh, feudalistic. Uh, so you basically have the king, uh, Kim Jong-un, and he has all of his deputies, his fiefs, right, uh, his lords, and he gives them specific rights. Uh, so, you know, one guy can trade in uh, food oils, uh, and he'll be like the Ministry of Foreign Trade. 
And then you'll have the intelligence service, the RGB, and they can do hacks. Um, and they can also buy and sell, you know, car parts. And so they have these monopolies on these little spaces, and then they bring in that money, and then they pay it up to Kim. They give him like a, a, a loyalty payment every year. So every one of these government ministries has its little fief. And for the intelligence service, that fief uh, is hacking, and that's the main one. And so this system, right, the way that this worked back in 2016, that kind of blew up. Uh, North Korea, its foreign trade got really restricted. But like we talked about before, uh, they just got really lucky that crypto kind of supplanted it. Um, and so this is kind of the contemporary model here. Uh, you have North Korean hackers stealing crypto. You have North Korean IT workers out there just making money from normal projects. And that money ultimately gets funneled back into the same bankers. Um, and Shim Hyun Sup, you'll see his name there. Uh, he was indicted last year for his role in this conspiracy. Uh, he, his job, right, as a North Korean banker, is to take that money, uh, run it through his partners, who are often these OTC currency traders, and then get that into banks. And then that'll be funneled through the normal, you know, traditional financial system, uh, often through correspondent accounts in the United States, to go buy, you know, the goods and services that North Korea needs and wants. Because as of now, luckily, they can't do that in crypto. Oops, Oops. sorry. Back one. My bad. Uh, so this is really key. I think most of the audience is probably, you know, in the traditional finance space. Um, this is how uh, CMLOs, Chinese money laundering organizations, right? They actually transform stolen USDT from hacks and they turn it into usable money. So uh, key point, right, is North Korea, they're going to be stealing you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these other tokens. But that whole intermediary process of them laundering it, uh, which you just, I just summarized as crypto laundering on here, almost always that ends by converting it into USDT, uh, which is a stable coin, right? So it's pegged to the dollar uh, on the Tron blockchain, which is extremely popular with Chinese users. Uh, and so the whole point of this, right, is to get it into the hands of these brokers and these brokers are part of this incredibly elaborate network. And this is highly simplified for the purposes of our presentation. Um, but typically, uh, what they'll be doing, right, the, like this shadow banking economy that exists for China and Chinese uh, speakers throughout the world, it's a way to efficiently move money and evade Chinese currency controls. So if folks may not know, uh, you know, China has very restrictive amounts. Uh, you can only move about $50,000 a year out of China, the purpose of which is to keep the money in China and invest it in China. Um, but, you know, a lot of Chinese criminals, uh, Chinese corrupt government officials, and just ordinary Chinese businessmen who've made a lot of money, they want to get their money out of China to go buy things like investment homes in Vancouver, Canada, uh, or in California, or to buy Maseratis for their children who are going to college uh, in the United States. And so you ask yourself, how do they do that if they can only move $50,000 a year? The old answer was a lot of smurfing, right? They would they would bring up, they would pay intermediate people in China just to, as dummies, basically, who they weren't going to move $50,000. They didn't have $50,000. And so they just get a commission, basically, to use their identity to move that money. But what has kind of supplanted it now are these these Chinese money brokers. And the way they work is they'll take money from a domestic Chinese user, right, uh, who wants to get it to California. They'll take that as a deposit in a Chinese bank. They'll use crypto as a ledger mechanism to send money to a Chinese partner, usually a, a criminal uh, in the United States, who's collecting money from drug traffickers, from prostitution, uh, lots of cash. And that US-based broker, he's gonna move that money into bank accounts in America or using um, cashier's checks. And then once he receives a signal basically from his China-based partner, uh, usually as a, a transaction in USDT, he'll make that money available in the United States to the Chinese uh, uh, you know, customer who wants to buy the house or send money to his kid. And crypto, right, is this lubricant mechanism where it used to be trust-based. You know, you'd have to know this person. You'd have to keep a ledger. Now they just use crypto and USDT on Tron to settle all these transactions with each other. Uh, and make the money available to whoever their users are. And then on the back end, that you know goes into trafficking and whatnot. But this is basically how uh, you know somebody's able to sell dirty crypto uh, is there's a lot of demand for this uh, from these Chinese money laundering networks because they use it 
for all these other purposes. Uh, and then ultimately, yeah. right, that money gets funneled to the banks and bought, buys all kinds of stuff. Yeah, Nick, let's give them an on-chain example, and then we can hit on some more questions. Uh, I liked the totally. liquid hack from a couple of years ago, I think illustrates pretty well just how um, you know, early on, North Korea was very quick to just like get it to an exchange, get it to an off ramp and be able to convert it out. And they were generally more able to do it at that time, but as law enforcement and regulators and the crypto companies themselves become more astute to these things, North Korea has had to evolve and keep changing their tactics and become more complicated and have those keep dropping those getaway cars as we talked about before. You wanna walk people through this uh, at a high level, yeah, what yeah. happened here? So this is you know highly abstracted, right? Uh, but, but basically what you see here is on the immediate left, right? That's the theft. They, they hack into this, in this case, it's a Japanese exchange. They steal the money, um, but it's in tokens, right? Uh, and if you're not familiar with crypto, I wouldn't pay too much attention to this. But the, a lot of these centralized tokens can be frozen by their issuers. So they want to swap them into stuff like Ethereum, which can't be frozen. And so that's this first section here on the left. It's them just swapping out of these tokens into Ethereum. And the second thing they do is they get all that into Bitcoin. Um, so Bitcoin, there's a lot more anonymity and anonymization services available there. Um, they'll run them through on Ethereum on Tornado Cash, but then they're going to go through another multiple series of mixers, uh, step three, basically, uh, to try to further break that chain and slow down the government or us from following them. And then they, you know, you can't deposit, in this case, I think they stole about $100 million. You can't deposit $100 million to a crypto exchange, right? That's not typically how it works, especially when you're using dummy accounts. Oh, you could so try. What they do is they'll... Nick, you could try. Uh, it would not be very successful. Um, and we've seen this happen, right? Uh, because, you know, in the old days, it was quite common to see them deposit one or $2 million at a time. But as surveillance has gotten better, um, you know, those funds get frozen. They don't like that. And so they've gotten these amounts down into the tens of thousands uh, that they'll use. Um, and so that, that terminant point right there uh, at the very end is an exchange. And that's not really the end of the story. Um, that's where it basically enters into that Chinese money laundering network that we just showed you a second ago. Um, and then that's just kicking off the whole fiat laundering process, um, which unfortunately, TRM, we don't have subpoena authority, so we can't give you uh, a great narrative on how they're doing that at this moment. Um, but if it's like it was a couple years ago, you know, it's going to be funneled into offshore accounts and shell companies and then, you know, be run through several of those uh, before being used to actually buy anything. Yeah, I think we've got like, thank you, Nick, about seven minutes left. Brian, should we hit some questions? Brian, I think you're on mute. Well, I'll just go to a couple here I see. Um, so yeah. from a Michelle here, uh, what is Tron? So Tron is a blockchain. Um, it's like Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Tron is one that was uh, created um, by an a entrepreneur named Justin Sun. Um, it's extremely popular. I think it probably has the, the greatest total uh, you know, value traded per year of all blockchains. Um, but it, it's not central, right? Like it's, there's no one entity that controls it. So it, it's like Bitcoin, right? You can't go in there and freeze accounts on Tron. It's, it's just a platform that's used. Yeah, I see another question from John asking about NFTs as a medium for money laundering. Uh, NFTs have phased out a little bit, but uh, great question, John. We've actually seen uh, North Korean and others use NFTs as a medium for money laundering. So one example, North Korea in a heist a few years ago is converted into NFTs. I'm not sure exactly why they did it. I think it's one, they're just always opportunistic in trying to look for new ways. And if there's a way to break up that trail, uh, they're gonna take advantage of it, but it's not really a thing that they do too frequently. But we've also seen just people kind of like wash trading NFTs, buying and selling it amongst themselves, almost like you have your house, you just keep selling it by 10% every time, but you sell it within your like kind of family so that when you last sell it, it's up, you know, 50% higher than it would have other been. You now have this fake history behind it to be able to argue why this price should be high. Uh, we've also seen examples of where some people pretended that their NFTs were stolen uh, only to be 
uh, to try and get recouped through some type of, I think it was an insurance policy or um, maybe they loaned it. I forget exactly. Um, but they actually stole it amongst themselves and then tried to launder the proceeds. Uh, so I think there's a, one of my favorite sayings is like, uh, there's no such thing as new crime, just old crimes reinvented. And we continue to see that across many different areas. I have my, uh, my crypto, crypto punks NFT shirt on here today to, uh, to rep the NFT field. <laughs> we're, not, Beautiful. we're not touching on it too hard, but uh, I, hopefully I'm back. Uh, I did just want to throw out a great point that that on this slide that Nick also reiterated, which is it's just fascinating to see in this presentation the way that crypto has pervaded like the criminal ecosystem so broadly outside of like just direct North Korean activity and the connection back to cash based money laundering and particularly domestic cash based money laundering. And Moyar in the chat says it sounds like. Chinese mirror trading techniques used frequently for laundering drug proceeds in North America and the EU are also just bleeding over into kind of the, the crypto crime arena as well. Um, so, you know, just for all the folks out there at banks, other financial institutions, this is like much broader problem than, you know, crypto hacks on a you know, smart contract or something. This activity is absolutely Definitely. touching your institution. Yeah, so I mean, really fascinating to see that. Totally, a key point here, right, is uh, ultimately, like when you look at the the like proximity of all these things on blockchains, uh, they're very close, right? Like you will see narcotics trafficking and North Korean hacking, and they are side by side. Uh, it is the same organizations, right? Ultimately, that are converting those illicit funds into usable money, and they're doing it through traditional banking. Because still, right, people don't typically take USDT in payment for all the stuff that they want to buy, right? It has to ultimately end up in the real banks. Um, and so, yeah, it's it can be easy to kind of Heisman this and say, this is a degenerate, you know, degenerate crypto problem. Um, but it really has become everybody's problem. Uh, it's all highly interlinked now. Uh Really interesting question. I imagine you both have some experience with this. Uh, you know, you mentioned some of the folks from that indictment, um, Sumi Hoon Sop or Jami Chen. Um, first of all, do we know where, where they currently are? Are they hiding in China? And as a follow up, what are the keys to effective cross border collaboration with law enforcement and or FIs for these international investigations? I mean, so much of this activity, as you pointed out, is very international, right? Um, how do you how do you execute on that kind of cooperation to to build these cases? Yeah, yeah. So I think I mean to Moyara's point there, uh, th it's all correct except for the hiding. They're not hiding in China. <laughs> they're they're living normal lives in China because the Chinese are basically doing nothing to stop this stuff. Um, and that was you know a huge source of frustration for me when I was in government. Uh, we did some major litigation against Chinese banks uh, about this issue, especially about complying with uh, U.S. subpoenas. And so these authorities exist. Uh, you know, if people aren't aware of them, the Patriot Act gives the Department of Justice the authority to subpoena foreign bank records from foreign banks if they have U.S. correspondent accounts. Uh, and we did that in the case of China a couple of times. Um, but that was after a multi-year process, right, of getting no cooperation from the Chinese at all on this. Uh, now, that's China. Right. But the rest of the world, uh, I think, especially after 2016 on North Korea, the issue uh, collaboration was radically improved. And we did a lot of things that I never thought were possible. Uh, so the Singaporeans are extremely helpful. We even extradited a North Korean out of Malaysia, which used to be one of North Korea's key foreign partners. Uh, so cross border cooperation uh, has you know, radically improved. Um, over the last several years. But but China and Russia, they're the, the gaping black holes in this whole environment. Excellent. Yeah, for sure. I presented to the United Nations panel of experts to which China and Russia were sitting on at the time about this very thing. And an indictment is ultimately an allegation that so-and-so uh, created did some type of criminal conduct. And so, you know, an allegation, it's one person's uh, truth, perhaps, and they may see it otherwise and have this other stance of that, like, yeah, that's your opinion. Uh, we'll keep on doing our thing and he can stay here just fine. Well, and just yeah. to that point, the, the Russians vetoed the United Nations panel on North Korea uh, earlier this year. So they literally killed 
<laughs> the, the one multinational surveillance entity that existed on this issue. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, it points to the, the unfortunate reality of the, the international scope and the nation state, you know, challenge of, uh, of crypto crime, which uh, none of us can, can necessarily solve. Uh, but I do appreciate, Nick and Chris, you giving some practical, you know, insights on how this activity plays out so we can do what we can do at the compliance level or the investigative level. And it starts really with just like a really solid understanding of our adversaries, in this case, North Korea, how they operate, what they're targeting, and ultimately where they're moving the funds. So I really appreciate that, that groundwork. Um, we are at time. If we did not get to your question, I will absolutely share them with Nick and with Chris. And if you're hungry for more crypto knowledge, definitely recommend uh, our crypto compliance specialization course. Uh, if you didn't attend the Q&A session, we did record it. It's available on demand, actually, along with all of the sessions from other, earlier today and all of the rest of the sessions during the course of this event will be recorded and uh, available on demand. Um, and if you use the code CRYPTO2024, you can save 10% on our certification, on the C2S, on membership renewal uh, until next Friday. And, this also applies to our accelerator program, which I barely told you about, but this is a structured classroom program for our CFCS course. Um, highly recommended if you're interested in a more guided experience to become CFCS certified, but you can use that, use that coupon code for any of these, including the accelerator program. I wanna give a big round of applause to everybody in the chat. Um, you guys were great. Everybody who attended, and I see a lot of uh, a lot of uh, kudos to Nick and Chris in the chat. Excellent presentation, really great insights, great stuff. Thank you. This was very insightful. Definitely echo that uh, on behalf of ACFCS. Always appreciate uh, you both guiding us on this topic. And uh, unfortunately, there's always more to talk about, right? So <laughs> I'm sure we'll do it again sometime. <laughs> Until next so. year. Yeah, uh, maybe sooner, you know, maybe we'll have a big hack and we'll bring it back early. So, but uh, no, this was great. Big round of applause to Nick, uh, to Chris. Uh, again, uh, thank you for the, uh, the time and the expertise. Um, and we have another session starting up in just a few minutes, which I am supposed to be on. So I'm going to go jump over there. I'll let you go for now, everybody. Uh, bye for now. And let's keep it rolling with more Crypto Compliance Symposium with our OFAC presenter talking about appropriately sanctions. Uh, so I'll see you there and we'll continue on this theme in just a few minutes. Bye for now, everyone.